Thank you all for coming out to tonight's Urban Forestry Education webinar. Tonight's webinar is titled Effect of Invasive Species on the Urban Trees. Any questions throughout the webinar, you can put in the chat function on the bottom. We will be saving all questions until the end of the presentation. Additional information about upcoming webinars in this Urban Forestry Education Series can be found on our website at ccenasa.org. Support from this pro for this program comes from the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation through their Urban and Community Forestry Program. We will be offering some ISA CEU credits for tonight's webinar. If you would like to receive credit, please provide your full name and your ISA certification number at the end of the webinar through the chat. We will send a reminder about that at the end. Uh, once again, we'll be saving all questions to the end. If you'd like to put them into the chat function, we'll answer those at the end. All right, turning it over to you, Devaney. Thank you, Michael. I uh, welcome to everyone to our um, the next chapter in our urban forestry programming here. Um, hope everybody had a, a great Thanksgiving and a little uh, rest over the weekend. Um, tonight, we're going to um, talk about uh, invasive species. Um, which there are many. Um, we're focusing on the ones that um, have affected uh, urban trees, trees in our community, street trees, trees in our natural areas, forests and so on, parks, um, private properties, um, as well as commercial properties. So um, let me uh, get moving on this and So what has the effect of invasive species been on urban trees? Well, first of all, um, they, they can be devastating. They can wipe out um, or eliminate species uh, entirely or almost entirely. Um, they can um, significantly impact um, things like um, our economy, human health, um, our um, natural areas, our, the ecosystems, wildlife, um, and so on and so forth. Um, but I, if I wanted to put it in a nutshell, I think um, invasive species have been um, somewhat devastating um, overall. In this slide here that I have up um, is, is an example. We, we, uh, we have this um, invasive plant, it's called kudzu. Um, this is actually um, a shot from down south where, um, you know, down in Georgia and throughout the south, it grows much more prolifically than it does here in New York. We do have it on Long Island in certain locations in small little outbreak areas. Um, like, a man, like many invasive species, you tend to find them along um, transportation um, areas like um, railroads, railroad tracks, roadways. Um, our um, mobile society has been done a real good job of moving many of these um, plants that are not native to our uh, area uh, from other areas of the country or from other parts of the world. Um, we live in New York. New York is a, a worldwide hub. We've got you know, several major airports. We've got um, a uh, significant um, system of roadways. So um, whatever's out there in the world of invasive seems to find us here on Long Island pretty easily. And that's just what kudzu can do to uh, a natural ecosystem um, if you let it. So, um, I'm not specifically going to talk too much about this or really not at all because it's not something that we have in a significant way here. However, um, I did want to cover what um, officially determines um, if a species is invasive. There is actually an executive order that defines this. Uh, an invasive species is a species that is non-native or alien to the ecosystem under consideration and whose introduction causes or is likely to cause health, economic or environmental harm or harm to humans. 
What you need to know about invasives, um, invasive species are those non-native plants, animals, and diseases that can cause harm to the economy, environment, and human health. Most introduced plants do not cause problems. However, those that do not, that do have a significant economic and environmental, environmental cost. You know, when we think about uh, many of our garden plants, many of uh, the plants we use in our landscapes, um, most, many of them um, are from other parts of the world. Um, some of them can be a little bit, um, a little aggressive, we call it, um, in the landscape. Um, they can spread a bit, um, but for the most part, most of them are not escaping into the, uh, natural areas or um, reproducing at any great length uh, to really cause much harm. Um, but, but there are some that are. So um, problem causing invasive species pose a threat to urban forests, which provide important environmental, social, and economic values, such as reduced storm water runoff, improved air quality, energy conservation, improved public health, and increased property values. So um, it's important that we learn about these. It's important that we identify what's happened in the past, um, identify what's happening now. And um, we will cover um, some uh, potential um, invasives that are probably um, coming our way. It's, it's not a matter of if they will come here, it's when they will come here. So we'll cover that. Invasive plants reproduce and grow quickly, easily invading adjacent natural areas, woodlands, and even landscaped areas. Invasive insects and diseases weaken and sometimes kill trees or um, make them hazardous. Uh, in this photo, this is um, a photo of uh, the beginning of the last outbreak of Asian longhorn beetle in the Farmingdale quarantine area. This was about 2013. Um, this tree, this, uh, this was a um, red maple. Uh, I don't know if you can see, if you look closely at the trunk above and below the yellow quarantine sign, you'll see uh, little exit holes. Uh, this tree was riddled with, I, I think literally it, hundreds if not thousands of exit holes from the Asian longhorn beetle. And uh, this was in 2013. This was sort of a secondary outbreak that happened. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit more later about the um, Asian longhorn beetle. So what does this have to do with you, me, us? Um, invasives, invasive propagules, which are plant parts that can create new plants. Uh, insects and diseases can be moved by human activity, including you, landscape and tree care professionals. Often in, it's often in yard, it's often in or on yard waste, wood, wood chips, compost, topsoil, new plants and soil moved by planes, trains, trucks, automobiles, and on things we put in such modes of transportation. So when you think about it, um, we're, humans are probably the way that most of these invasives um, get around. They sort of hitch a ride on our um, modes of transportation. Invasive species displace, weaken, or kill desirable plants resulting in the loss of diversity, uh, it degrade wildlife habitat, they interfere with recreational activities, disrupt urban ecosystems, and divert millions of your tax dollars for their control. Because for many of these um, problems, um, the only solution is to um, identify those trees that are infected, uh, remove them and replace them. And typically it's at the expense of the taxpayer. So that's why it's important to um, know what's out there, um, help with the process of reporting, um, if you do see them, and we're going to cover this a little later on how to do that, uh, and be aware of um, these uh, potential threats to the trees in our urban forests. A good place to start if you're looking for um, 
a, uh, a website to go to and a good source of information is right right here in our own um, Long Island Invasive Species Management um, website. Uh, it's called, um, the organization is called LISMA, L-I-I-S-M-A, Long Island Invasive Species Management Area is what it stands for. And it's one of, uh, I believe there's about eight um, of these prisms um, this Long Island area, you can see it goes from Staten Island to um, Orient Point and Montauk Point. Um, and it's, it's uh, PRISM stands for Regional Invasive Species Management. And uh, so this website is sort of um, a good place to go to find out about invasives and um, um, find out about the individual plants or animals or, um, and, and, and it includes uh, both um, terrestrial um, organisms as well as aquatic um, invasive species. We're just going to cover urban trees. I mean, I, you know, this, this could take hours and hours to cover if we covered everything. So, but if you're interested, visit this website. So I wanted to cover tonight um, some examples of invasive species in the urban forest. Um, it's it's going to include some of them, some of those that um, are um, from the past, uh, some from the um, present, and there'll actually be um, a couple of them um, that will be uh, hopefully, I wish not here, but um, they probably will show up. So um, these are the um, Invasives that I wanted to talk about uh, tonight, hope there's eight of them. Um, hopefully we'll get through them um, in time. So chestnut blight, Dutch elm disease or DED, Dutch elm disease, Norway maple, tree of heaven, or it's also known as or commonly called Atlantis, um, gypsy moth, uh, Asian longhorn beetle, Emerald ash borer or EAB, uh, spotted lanternfly, which uh, is L S L F. So let's get started with um, the American chestnut and uh, chestnut light. Um, if you've never seen a big old chestnut tree, like the one in the photo on the left, um, this disease is most likely the reason why, chestnut blight. Uh, according to the American Chestnut Foundation, the American chestnut tree once dominated the eastern half of the US. Uh, its natural range, as the map shows on the right, um, could be found throughout the, uh, East, Midwest, and it actually has uh, stands on the West Coast um, because early settlers carried chestnut chestnuts with them and planted them um, for their new farms and homes. So, but this is uh, on this map is the natural range of the American chestnut um, because it could grow rapidly and attain huge sizes, as as in the photo. Um, the tree was often the outstanding visual feature in both urban and rural landscapes. The wood was used wherever strength and rot resistance was needed. It was a highly valuable timber crop. Um, in colonial America, chestnut, the chestnut was ref the preferred species for log cabins, especially um, the bottom rot prone foundation logs. Later posts, poles, flooring, and railroad ties were all made from chestnut lumber. The edible nut was also a significant contributor to the rural economy. Hogs and cattle were often fattened for market by allowing them to forage in the chestnut dominated forests. Ch chestnut ripening coincided with the holiday season and in the uh, Turn of the century, newspapers articles often showed train cars overflowing with chestnuts rolling 
into major cities to be sold fresh or roasted. Chestnuts sold and eaten today are from European and Asian species or hybrids, uh, crosses of these species. Uh, the American chestnut was truly a heritage tree and was considered a keystone species uh, tree for providing all kinds of wildlife with food and shelter. Its loss was devastating to many ecosystems throughout its native range. You know, some say that even uh, the uh, wildlife has never um, truly recovered to the levels that it once was when the uh, um, American chestnut dominated the landscape. So all of this began at or slightly before the turn of the century with the introduction of this disease, Cryphonectria parasitica, the causal agent of chestnut blight. The disease, the disease re reduced the American chestnut from its position as the dominant tree species in the Eastern forest ecosystem to little more than an early succession stage shrub. There has been essentially no chestnut lumber sold in the US for decades and the bulk of the annual 20 million pound nut crop now comes from uh, the introduced um, hybrid species or, or it's imported. Um, uh, and if you look at the photo on the left there, um, that's a good example of um, an old stump that keeps sending up sprouts. You still do uh, find American chestnuts doing this. If you go into wooded or forested areas, um, the stumps just keep seem to, you know, push out new uh, shoots. They live for a few years, but um, if you look closely, especially at the picture on the bottom right, uh, they develop the um, the canker that is caused by this fungus, and uh, that is um, shoot, kind of uh, clogs off the vascular system of the branch in the trunk and um, you get um, significant dieback uh, afterwards. Uh, the picture on the uh, upper right hand corner uh, is uh, an example of an infection on a smaller um, twig. Um, so it is it is quite um, devastating and um, it, it is amazing that these trees that you find sometimes in these wooded, wooded areas keep, you know, trying to come back, but, um, um, you know, they tend to not make it for too long. So I, I know a lot of people do come to me and say, uh, oh, I found a chestnut tree and it's, you know, maybe it's a blight resistant one, but nine times out of 10, I don't, I don't think there's ever been uh, one naturally found that's resistant. Um, so. Um, and in actuality, um, there were several uh, other fungal diseases of chestnut trees um, that also came over to Europe from Europe um, that also impacted chestnut trees over time. But the chestnut blight, this one particular disease, virtually eliminated the mature uh, chestnut trees. That's why you don't see any, you know, huge ones. You might find some, and they do exist out in the Midwest and on the West Coast in isolated areas, big old chestnut trees. But here in the Northeast and on Long Island, there uh, it would be rare to find a very large old um, chestnut tree. Um, the disease is uh, widespread throughout the United States. Um, and there is no um, known recommended fungicide to cure um, chestnut blight. So, but, um, the good news is after decades of work breeding trees, the American Chestnut Foundation, a partner in the far, with the Forest Service, uh, Forest Service's efforts to restore the tree is close to being able to um, introduce blight resistant American chestnuts. Um, and the work also continues uh, at the American Chestnut Research and Restoration Project at SUNY ESF. Um, for developing uh, blight resistant American chestnuts. They're doing uh, uh, work with genetics and creating a, a genetically modified um, American chestnut that um, it's hoped that can be released into and around in, into the 
wild uh, around um, these um, chestnut trees, um, stumps that keep resprouting, and it's hoped that maybe um, they can cross pollinate each other and maybe and maybe naturally create a more um, chestnut blight resistant um, um, uh, cross, you know, bred naturally. Uh, natural crosses out in the wild with some of the genetics that they're introducing into these um, trees from the research uh, and development project. So it is hoped, uh, I think um, they're actually uh, petitioning um, now currently to uh, get approval to release the genetically modified trees out into the, um, out into the public and start planting them. So they, so there is hope for the uh, American chestnut. Maybe one day uh, we'll see um, the return of the American chestnut tree, or at least maybe our um, children or grandchildren will. So let's move on to Dutch elm disease or uh, abbreviated DED. Um, that's the, the name of it if you see at the top of the screen there, Ophiostoma ulmi. And the uh, newer version of it is uh, Novo Um You know, these diseases do mutate, they do change. Um, so, um, you know, this is, this is what's happened with um, Dutch elm disease, you know. Um, at one time, Dutch, the, um, the American elm, also known as the white elm, um, seen here in the photo uh, from Cornell University about 1940. Um, this tree uh, dominated um, many of the urban landscapes as the um, ultimate street tree, creating these um, arching um, uh, tunnels or uh, cathedral-like tunnels um, throughout the streets of um, the urban areas. Um, but, you know, then Dutch elm disease came and today um, the same street in a similar area this is what you see, the, the elms are all gone and it is quite a different uh, look and feel to the, um, to the landscape, to the ecosystem that's there. So um, according to um, Michigan State University, Dutch elm disease is a lethal vascular wilt disease of American elm that is caused by this um, Dutch elm disease pathogen. Um, while once um, widespread throughout the Northeast, the American elms, um, now they're um, sort of um, rare to find, but they're not uh, totally gone. Um, although American elms were the dominant tree species along city and suburban streets across the Eastern United States um, throughout the 20th cent uh, century, um, disaster struck when elm log shipped from Europe to the United States uh, released the elm bark beetle, a small insect that carried the fungal disease of elms uh, with them and infected the trees. The relationship between the fungus and the beetle helped to quickly spread the disease from tree to tree, leaving city streets lined with dead dying elms uh, first found in Ohio in the 1930s, it spread from state to state, and by the 1960s, it had killed millions of trees, leaving cities with the uh, task of removing thousands of massive elms. Um, the loss of the American elm as a street tree left a hole that was difficult to replace. Um, maples and ashes were planted in uh, larger numbers along streets to replace the elm. But ash tree populations were decimated by another insect, the emerald ash borer, which we're going to get to in a few minutes. Now, the, now many of this, now many cities have a mix of linden, honey locust, sycamore, ginkgo, hackberry, zelkova, varying species of maples and oaks and other smaller trees like hornbeam and crab apples. Yet none of them, none of them match the beauty that the tree line. Uh, streets and parkways uh, and the tunnels and the cathedral-like look that the Amer American elms created. 
Um, are, American, are American elms um, becoming scarce in our landscape? I mean, you do see them around. I uh, certainly do see them. Actually, they're not as rare as um, maybe American chestnut are because the tree is such a, such a prolific cedar and you can see the little seed pods there in the photo in the bottom left-hand corner uh, of the photo. Um, they're very prolific and they produce a lot of seeds and um, you tend to get um, elm seedlings and saplings uh, proliferating, proliferating around along water courses and in fields and in natural areas. Um, so they're, um, they're still around, um, but they're not um, resistant to the um, Dutch elm disease. And the, uh, so um, what uh, researchers have been doing is that they've been working on creating, creating um, elm, Dutch elm disease resistant uh, varieties. Um, there are actually, there is actually several of them that are out there right now. Actually, they've been out for a number of years and they seem to be doing uh, fairly well. Um, occasionally they do come down with the disease, but nowhere near as de devastating as the, um, the uh, non-cultivar uh, types that, um, or the, uh, you know, uh, natural types that uh, once dominated the landscapes. Um, one cultivar is called Valley Forge, another one New Harmony. There are several other uh, disease resistant varieties too that um, seem to be doing quite well. Uh, research is going on. A lot of these new introductions were developed by the, um, the National Arboretum. So there is hope. Um, there also is uh, some fungicide research that's been looking promising. Um, effective fungicides might prevent and prolong the life of the uh, selected elms, but um, it must be uh, applied and reapplied. Um, and typically it's done by root or tree-based injections. Um, so it's something that needs to be ongoing and carefully monitored. Um, other problems exist with these uh, fungicide inject injections is that the the holes that are left behind can, can possibly be a, a conduit for other pests, um, diseases, other problems that, um, you know, could result in decay. So, um, you know, I guess nothing's perfect, but there is, um, you know, some hope there. Um, management and control of the Dutch elm disease includes periodic monitoring for signs of the disease like wilting of the branches and lab testing, pruning out infective parts and preventative fungicide injections to control both the fungus and the beetles uh, um, seem to be effective. So all is not lost, but you're not gonna see the great numbers that we once did um, of uh, American elms, uh, maybe for, for a while until those more reliable and um, cost-efficient ways of um, controlling this disease. So let's move on to Norway, map uh, Norway maple, Acer platinoides. Um, the uh, Norway maple is a large deciduous tree that can grow up to 40 to 60 feet in height. They are tolerant of many of uh, the urban environmental conditions and have become a very popular um, tree to plant uh, on streets and on lawns and uh, in parks because of their um, hardiness and tolerance of uh, uh, pollution, actually. Um, Norway maples are native to Europe in Western Asia, so they're not uh, one of our native maples. We do have uh, native maples that um, we can use as alternatives to the Norway maple, and they include uh, the red maple, the sugar maple, as well as the silver maple. Um, so, um, you know, uh, I guess the, the thing that we suggest that we do with maples is identify those maples that are around and um, remove them and replace them with, with either one of the um, 
native maples or, um, you know, one of the uh, alternatives. Um, maples are quite devastating to the um, to many ecosystems. Healthy forests are generally more likely um, to ward off invaders and be able to, you know, be more sustainable. Uh, Norway maple has been found to be, um, because it's very successful in establishing itself, it's very prolific in producing seed and uh, seedlings. And um, it's also very, um, creates a very deeply shaded um, under, uh, under itself uh, when it matures. Um, the dense shade prevents a lot of the native species of trees and other um, plants uh, from growing underneath it. So it um, inhibits a lot of the uh, native plants from growing. So that changes the ecosystem and that has a very negative effect on um, all, all the native species of uh, flora and fauna that are um, important in our ecosystem. So um, this is the reason why, uh, you know, um, Norway maple is identified as an invasive and why we need to um, keep it in check. Um, right now, you're not allowed to uh, plant it or transport it or reproduce it uh, because it is on the invasive species list. Um, um, so you can, as you can see here in the upper left-hand corner of this photo, these are seedlings of Norway maple. You can see how dense even just the stand of the seedlings are. Um, they, they have these wide, broad, um, dark green leaves. They're beautiful. They're, they are beautiful trees. They are nice. Um, but um, because they produce such a dense shade, they really can change the... Uh, the uh, environment underneath them and they can suppress uh, anything from growing. If you've ever tried to grow anything in your garden, if you have a uh, Norway maple, it really becomes uh, challenging to grow um, any kind of garden plants or shrubs and trees under a maple. Um, their roots are very um, dense and uh, shallow rooted. Uh, they do uh, easily um, uh, damage um, sidewalks and driveways. So, um, you know, you do have that factor there. Um, the other photos here in the middle, the yellow, that's the yellow flowers in the spring. Um, you see on the bottom right hand side, the seed, the polynoses, or what the, they're actually called Samaras, or some uh, kid, you know, when you're a kid, I guess we call them helicopters. When they're ripe, they fall from the trees and they kind of spin around to disperse and uh, create seedlings everywhere. Um, um, they're widely spread throughout the Northeast uh, and on the West Coast, as you can see here in this map. So they are wreaking havoc everywhere. And the last thing I wanna say about this tree is again, the, um, the method of control is to um, remove the tree, you know, destroy the tree, uh, replace it with uh, either another native maple or um, one of the appropriate alternatives um, in the area. Uh, eradicating it um, as a seedling is pretty easy. The, uh, the um, seedlings are easy to pull out, especially after um, a rainfall or uh, after irrigation, they pull out easily from moist soil. The best, uh, the best way to uh, control it is if you do see it coming up, uh, especially along fence lines and such, just um, give, it a, give it a pull and uh, put it in the trash uh, before it be becomes a big problem. So um, that's uh, Norway maple and why we uh, consider it a uh, invasive. And moving on to uh, Tree of Heaven uh, or Atlantis, uh, which is it's common, also commonly known as. Uh, tree of Heaven, it's a uh, deciduous tree. You've probably seen it everywhere. It's very common, especially in uh, city areas, urban areas. Um, it is a native of uh, central China as well as Taiwan. Um, Interestingly enough, it was brought over to the United States um, back in the 1700s um, to the Philadelphia area 
uh, and was introduced as a, um, a shade tree. And um, because it was tough and um, uh, tolerant of city conditions, um, it was uh, valued for that purpose as a tough city street tree. And, uh, you know, that, you know, that's how it kind of got its start here in the United States. It, all, it was also introduced on the West Coast. So it is uh, an invasive on the West Coast as well. Um, and uh, I know New York City um, uh, was planting them back in the early 1900s as a street tree. There are some big old trees you find uh, around um, the New York Botanic Garden and big old specimen trees um, in the garden, in the Botanic Garden itself. They are a beautiful large shade tree, um, but what makes them invasive is that they uh, prolifically seed themselves everywhere and they, you know, sprout, you know, sprout everywhere. Um, they tolerate uh, disturbed soils. Um, so wherever there's been construction, de destruction, um, typically you'll find these trees. So they're, you know, a real problem. And, um, you know, they do get into the natural areas, into forested areas, and they displace um, and compete with our native tree species. So that's, you know, all the more reason for um, keeping these under control. Um, the uh, trees are, um, they have uh, female flowers on separate trees from male flowers. The female trees uh, produce the seeds and so um, while the um, male trees aren't as much of a problem as the females um, because they grow so prolifically and invade natural areas, uh, they all must go, so. Oh, by the way, um, let me go back. Well, um, The um, Atlantis tree also um, um, produces a chemical, um, a natural herbicide that actually causes, um, uh, prevents other tree species and plants from growing under its canopy. So um, it's very much like the um, black walnut, uh, where many plants find it difficult to grow um, near or around the uh, tree of heaven as well. So that, that's another reason why um, it's an invasive species and really not, not welcome in our ecosystems. Let's move on to gypsy moth. Gypsy moth is a, um, a problem for many of the deciduous trees as well as um, some of the conifers like pine trees. Um, Oak trees and maples uh, comprise uh, a majority of our urban trees and they happen to be the favorite of gypsy moth. Um, the photo on the left is um, uh, oak trees that were recently defoliated by a gypsy moth outbreak in the spring. Uh, typically what would happen is the uh, gypsy moths would uh, defoliate an oak tree and um, a lot of times if the oak tree is in fairly good health. Um, they'll they'll resprout new leaves and continue on. But if they're if they're devastated like that um, year in and year out, um, it weakens the trees and then they become more susceptible to other problems. Uh, in the middle, there's on the top is the gypsy moth caterpillar and the type of damage it does. It feeds on the leaves of trees. Um, center of the photo are uh, adult moths. Um, the white one is the female and the brown one is the male. And if you move down be to below that, uh, the lower picture in the center is, are um, uh, female moths laying eggs. These are the uh, egg sacs being laid on the bark of trees. Um, you can uh, look for these as um, um, Winter comes and uh, and spring is uh, about to arrive, and um, you can control this pest, particular pest problem with a um, just by scraping the 
the egg sacs off and um, discarding them. Uh, they can be um, a very effective way of controlling gypsy moth. Um, these are on the right hand side on the in the upper right hand corner are um, three different um, instars uh, or um, stages of development of the caterpillars. Um, they molt and then they um, cast off their skin and then they um, grow a little bit and then molt again. There's several instars a season and then uh, um, like um, many insects, they metamorphosize and the um, bottom right hand corner is the uh, pupating um, gypsy moth. It's uh, getting ready to um, emerge in, in the adult form, which again is the center picture. So um, it has a complete um, life cycle. Very devastating. It um, oftentimes though, um, now that it's been here for a number of years, it came from Europe, it came from France. It was part of a, um, an experiment to develop um, hardy silkworms here in the United States. It was an experiment that went bad. Some escaped and uh, infested our forests. Um, although it's not a significantly devastating problem, um, it does weaken trees in the area. It, it, can weak, it can be a problem in forest. It can be especially annoying and devastating on home landscapes and commercial areas and for street trees as well. Um, now it tends to run in cycles. Um, there are a lot of um, natural diseases and predators, including um, birds that have developed a liking for it. Um, there are there is a, um, a fungal disease or two that attacks them if the weather is right in the spring. Um, there's also a virus that is uh, around that acts as a natural control for them. So um, although insecticides, the traditional pesticides, as well as biological controls um, have been used to control this insect pest, sometimes it's just better to um, take a wait and see for the first few years uh, and see if the natural predators will knock it back um, naturally. So you do see outbreaks of it on Long Island. It does kind of move around. Um, it's not quite as devastating as it once was back in like the late 1970s through the early 80s when um, it seemed to be much more um, significant of, of a problem in our uh, urban landscapes. So that's gypsy moth. And now we move on to Asian longhorn beetle, which you see here, dark, um, it's a black colored beetles with the uh, white um, speckles on it. Um, its antenna are a little bit longer than the length of its body and it's striped black and white as well. Those are the identifying characteristics of it. Um, they're about an inch and a half long perhaps and um, they're not great flyers, but they can fly uh, short distances. And um, so they do spread. Um, the Asian longhorn beetle is an invasive wood boring insect that feeds on a variety of hardwoods, including maple, birch, elm, ash, poplar, um, also horse chestnut and willow. Um, so you can see from that list of um, trees that, um, it, it does attack many of the uh, common urban trees and especially the oaks, not the oaks, the maples, um, which dominate our landscape. Sycamore is another host species of it um, and is one of their uh, preferred species, host species. Um, it, is, can, it is and can be quite devastating. Um, the borers uh, create these uh, galleries um, throughout the heartwood and um, that weakens the tree. It actually um, makes it unsafe. Um, sometimes if left unchecked or noticed, um, it can cause branches to fall out of the trees. So it is a, um, a hazard. Um, there really hasn't been any um, uh, 
um, effective um, means of controlling it with pesticides. Once it's discovered, it's typically done significant damage. Um, so once the tree is identified, um, the only option that's really effective is removing the tree and replacing it with a non-host species. Um, Outbreaks, um, I think the biggest outbreaks started to occur in the mid 1990s. Um, uh, Norway maples in Brooklyn were discovered to have it as well as sycamore trees. Um, one of the ways to um, kind of um, get on top of this problem was to create quarantine areas, um, scout and find all of the infested trees and uh, remove them, take them down, chip them up to a certain uh, size dimension chip and um, replace those trees with um, alternative species that were uh, non-host species. So here on Long Island, we did have several um, quarantine areas uh, in Brooklyn, Manhattan, um, uh, Farmingdale uh, still exists as a quarantine area. Um, it was a small area in uh, Islip, but um, as far as I know, all of the our New York, Long Island area quarantines have been lifted except for the Farmingdale area, which they still continue to scout and remove trees. Um, so you can see by, see by this map that um, other cities um, have had these outbreaks. Um, Worcester, Mass, Massachusetts uh, was a significant uh, quarantine area for a long time, uh, as well as um, Chicago um, and other areas throughout the Northeast. So these are some photos to identify whether, you know, you, you might have uh, Asian longhorn beetle. Um, trees that are being attacked often exhibit wilted foliage. Um, these um, exit holes are a very um, identifying characteristic of this particular pest problem. As you can see uh, from the exit holes, you can get um, uh, sap weeping from them or you can um, have whole exit holes that are large enough to um, stick a pen or a pencil in. Um, also, um, a sawdust-like material called frass, which is the far right photo, um, is often a sign also. Um, so, you know, um, if you do s suspect you have this, um, report it. Um, the last, uh, one of the last slides in this presentation uh, will have the uh, information for how to report it and who to send uh, photos to. Uh, for reporting uh, Asian longhorn beetle as well as other invasives. So we'll get to that. And now I'd like to move on to uh, something, a pest, uh, invasive pest that recently arrived on Long Island, the uh, emerald ash borer, um, which um, we've started to see over the last year or so, maybe two years, um, affecting um, trees on Long Island. Um, Nassau County hasn't really had a lot of them. I think I have a map, the next slide. Um, but um, it is uh, devastating ash trees, which are in abundance in upstate New York, as well as other uh, states in the Northeast. Um, ash is a uh, valuable lumber tree. Um, as well as um, it's often used on Long Island as a street tree and occasionally in parks and on um, in commercial areas as well. Um, it creates these galleries that are kind of S-shaped. Um, it causes the bark to flake off or actually if you look on the right hand side Woodpecker activity is actually a sign that you might have it. Woodpeckers will start peeling the bark off and hanging around the tree. Uh, one of the telltale signs that you have it is um, the uh, trunks sprout um, 
um, a vast number of these um, sprouts, these uh, adventitious shoots. So that's a sign that you may have it. Um, dead limbs, as in this photo on the center of right, um, is a telltale sign that you have it. Of course, if you have um, one or more of these um, signs and symptoms, um, you probably have uh, emerald ash borer. It is specific, uh, an insect that seems to be right now very specifically um, targeting ash trees. Um, we don't have a lot of ash trees compared to other areas of the state, um, but um, I do see, I have seen this past summer, um, ash trees infe in infected with uh, emerald ash borer in uh, Suffolk County. Um, but Nassau County doesn't um, seem to have it. I think uh, if we look here, yeah, here's a map and the red um, counties are where it's been found. And here we are in Nassau County, um, kind of sandwiched in between, um, you know, two areas. And I would almost guess um, that we probably do have it, but because we have a very low population of ash trees, and or maybe nobody knows what to look for or um, realizes that they have the problem. It's probably here in Nassau County as well. Um, there are insecticides that can be injected into the tree. Um, again, you do need to repeat that. You need to stay on top of it. It's probably not really considered a very um, effective means of control. Um, once the uh, emerald ash borer gets into the, you know, tree under the bark, creating the um, chambers underneath it, it uh, destroys the vascular system, cuts off the um, flow of sap up and down the tree trunk, and the tree is um, usually uh, dead in a very short time, in, within a year or two. So, very devastating. That's what ash trees look like if you've never noticed or seen one up front, up close. And it has a typical life cycle of um, a beetle. It is a beetle. Um, so uh, eggs are laid um, in um, somewhere in June and July. Uh, they hatch. Um, the uh, Larva is a borer insect, gets into the bark. Um, they pupate, they turn into the uh, adult, and then the adults mate and continue the cycle all over again, laying eggs. And so, some things that you can do to help uh, reduce this pest problem, as with many invasive um, species, uh, do not move firewood if at all possible. If you do need or use firewood, and need to buy it, um, you know, make it local, do, you know, buy local, use it locally. Don't transport it miles away because there could be problems in the firewood. And if you do think that you have an infestation of any of the invasives, please report it um, to the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. And last but not least, um, this particular beauty is actually not here on Long Island yet, uh, we hope, um, but it's only a matter of time. Um, it's the spotted lanternfly. It's um, really, a, to me, it's a very scary pest, very, um, has a potential to do a lot of damage, uh, not just to, um, urban trees, but um, to everything, all, all, all kinds of plants. Um, this is an invasive uh, insect pest to be on the lookout for, kind of um, remember this photo and some of the following photos, because if you see it out there, it's really important that you um, report it. Um, you know, this is a beautiful insect, um, but, you know, there is a saying, uh, danger hides in beauty and beauty in danger. Um, despite its beauty, it's, uh, it's a 
it's a potential disaster waiting to happen in the urban forest. Let me. Uh, so the spotted lanternfly is an invasive pest from Asia, and it one of its favorite plants is uh, to feed on is the tree of heaven, which is this is it. This is a uh, leaf of the tree of heaven here. Um, another invasive species. So isn't that great? One invasive can control another invasive. Uh, that would be good news. However, the bad news is it also likes to feed on a wide variety of plants such as grapevines, hops, maple. Think of the sugar maples uh, upstate, walnut, fruit trees, and more than 70, yep, 70 other plant species, including many ornamentals used in home and commercial landscapes, as well as, as you know, trees that are street trees, trees that are in parks and um, other wild areas. This, imp this uh, insect could impact New York's forests as well as agriculture and tourism industries. Again, let me say it another way. Spotted lanternfly poses a significant threat to New York's agricultural crops, food security, forest health, and the economic value of ornamental landscape plants and tourism. In the US, spotted lanternfly was first discovered in Pennsylvania in 2014. And it has since been found in New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, and New York, upstate New York. The first New York state infestation was discovered in Staten Island recently in August of 2020. So it's right, you know, relatively uh, new in the area. So this is what they look like, the adults at the bottom, uh, as you saw before. Um, on the bottom right is the adult uh, with its wings closed. So it looks quite different um, resting there. Um, the, uh, the two top insects are uh, on the left side is a newly, relatively newly hatched uh, nymph. Is, um, and uh, on the right is um, how they change and start to develop some co color as they get a little older and then eventually um, become the um, adult, which is at the bottom right. So adults and nymphs use their sucking mouth parts to feed on the sap of more than 70 species of plants. Um, the feeding by the sometimes thousands of spotted lanternfly, um, because that's how they kind of uh, exist, uh, on a tree or a plant in the thousands, um, it stresses the plants, uh, makes them vulnerable to um, other diseases and attacks from other insects because it weakens the plants. Um, spotted lanternfly uh, excrete large amounts of sticky honeydew, uh, which attracts sooty mold that interfere with plant photosynthesis, negatively affecting the growth and the fruit yields of New York's annual yields of things like uh, apples and grapes um, that um, are estimated to have a combined value of over $358 million. So, you know, farmers, um, apple orchards and such are really worried about this. Vineyards are worried about this. Um, and uh, we all should be worried about it because um, it's going to affect everyone. Um, spotted lanternfly, this, um, if you do have an infestation, um, it will be in great numbers and it will be um, exuding this um, honeydew, which um, will land on everything in sight uh, on your property, on your patio furniture, your barbecue, your decks, patios, walkways, cars. You name it, it'll be covered with the honeydew. And um, the sooty mold, sooty mold grows on the honeydew. So sooty mold is a black kind of a mold that, well, it is a mold that grows on the sweet 
um, substance that the honeydew is, is made out of. So it's going to be devastating. Um, these insects can, you know, get around a little bit. They can fly short distances. Um, they spread around. Um, they get around quite uh, easily, though. Um, sometimes they can travel many miles by hitching a ride on vehicles or on firewood or outdoor furniture or stone or anything that's transported in a vehicle on a private vehicle, a commercial truck. Uh, it's been known to lay eggs on cars and trucks and, and, and um, as well as um, trains. Um, so it's uh, it it moves across you know around the uh, community quite easily um, with the help of humans. So um, this is something that um, we all need to be aware of. We all need to spread the word about, and we all need to take action if we do see it. Here's a photo on the left of the uh, egg masses that you'll find on not only trees, I mean, this is a photo of it on a tree, but um, these insects like to uh, lay these egg masses on almost anything. You know, stones, um, again, like I said, uh, patio furniture, uh, uh, vehicles, cars, trucks, uh, trains. Um, so keep an eye out for it. Um, on the right-hand side, um, a telltale sign that you might have uh, spotted lanternfly is uh, oozing wounds of, you know, sap oozing from a tree. Take a closer look, you know, check it out and, um, you know, make note of it and report it. Um, there's more information at this website here um, that I encourage everyone to take a look at. Uh, to learn more about this pest because um, I am really afraid of this one. So once it gets here and gets out of control, um, it'll be uh, very expensive and devastating. So, um, but um, that concludes my list of the invasives that we're gonna that we I had planned on talking about tonight. Um, you can take an active role. This is how you can help if you uh, think you found an invasive species, uh, whether it's a Asian longhorn beetle, ALB, or even um, emerald ash borer. If you do have an ash tree, keep a close look at it. Um, one of the programs that the DEC has is um, that they ask people to do is to check their pool filters. They have um, found that uh, people um, often will find Asian longhorn beetle in a pool filter. Um, Pool filters um, tend to also collect other invasive uh, insects as well because these uh, invasives sometimes drop into the pool and they get sucked into the filter. And lo and behold, when you're cleaning out the uh, filter, you'll you'll find them. Um, or if you just find the um, pests um, or something unusual, um, you know, take a photo of it. Um, they suggest you include something for scale in the photo, such as a coin or a ruler, or put it, you know, something that's recognizable next to it. Um, also make note of where you found it, um, locations, intersecting roads, landmarks, GPS coordinates, if you have that. If you find um, really anything, um, send a photo to uh, DEC's Forest Health uh, web um, email, and it's listed there, right here, Forest Health. They're the folks who are, you know, um, most interested in identifying invasives, but also they'll, um, you know, they're high, highly trained professionals in identifying um, those pests that are of concern and those that uh, may not uh, be of so much concern. And for spotted lanternfly, um, um, actually, because it's such an important um, invasive pest to be on the lookout for, they have a, a separate um, spotted lanternfly um, email that you can send the photos to for quick um, identification. So, um, you know, it's up to all of us to keep an eye out for this because as, as we've seen, 
um, some of these invasives have been quite devastating to the um, tree species uh, in our urban forest. So that is it for me. The end. I thank you all for attending this evening's program. So, Michael, do we have any questions or um, we have any? We do have a couple questions here. And uh, people, can people start putting in their ISA numbers? Yes, if you'll be requesting ISA CEU credits for your attendance tonight, you can put your full name and your ISA certification number into the chat. Um, the first question we have here is disposal in the trash a problem for any of these species? Can that contribute to spread in any way? I would suggest um, destroying them first. I don't know if there was a specific pest. Um, typically with the um, Asian longhorn beetle, um, that would be, um, the tree would be removed um, by the um, New York State Department of Ag and Markets or the New York State DEC or U.S. Forest Service, one of the uh, government agencies would handle that. Um, and they want to know where these trees are. So don't even, you know, bother to uh, take the tree down yourself or hire someone to do it. The, uh, the folks from the governmental agencies will be happy to, uh, you know, remove and uh, handle the debris properly. The um, emerald ash borer, um, again, chipping the tree um, to a, I forget what the dimensions are to, it's something like um, one inch by one inch chips is uh, sufficient enough. Any of the other insect pests, um, you have to take it on a case by case basis. Um, gypsy moth, I wouldn't be too concerned with. Um, you know, they, they're pretty common. And uh, if you wanted to remove them by hand, that's great. They also, um, you know, you could just squish them and, you know, throw them in the, tr in the trash. Um, or you can spray them. I mean, there are some biological controls that are pretty good. Um, again, um, you know, you have to take it on a case-by-case -case basis. I don't know if there's what you would do with any of the other pests. You're not going to worry about um, Dutch elm disease or American chestnut, but... Um, you know, any, any other insects, I would um, first have them properly identified before you do anything. They may not be um, a pest or it may not be the invasive that you think it is. Um, so before, you know, you do anything, send a photo off to uh, the GEC or you can even send me a photo. And, um, you know, that's a good place to start before you start going crazy with um, destroying everything. Remember that, um, you know, many insects are food for other wildlife, so you may not want to destroy everything out there just because it's, uh, you know, an insect or a bug or, you know, so. All right, so uh, what, what, do, what else do we have? You answered this question already, but if you just want to recap it again, is there a preferred removal method for the tree of heaven? Um, you know, as it, as it sprouts, you know, it's easier to dig out small trees than large trees. Uh, large trees, one of some of the things I want to warn you about with, um, uh, the tree of heaven is that, um, uh, this, if you're cutting it down yourself, make sure you wear protective equipment, you know, um, safety goggles. Um, you don't want to get the, um, sawdust in your eyes, there is a toxin in the sap. Um, so you don't wanna be fooling around with getting, ingesting that or getting it in your eyes. So I would certainly wear uh, eye protection. I would wear ear protection even. Um, I would wear a mask um, or I would hire somebody else to do it. It's always good to hire a professional. Um, you know, they gotta, they gotta pay bills too. So um, it's, it's also uh, safer to hire the professional as well. Excellent. We have a couple questions on Norway maples. 
Um, so the first question is, how can I tell if my maple is a Norway maple? And I'll include this question there also. Do you have a solution for removing Norway maples that grow quickly in the backyard areas? So one of the um, ways to identify a Norway maple from the native maples is, first of all, the leaf shape. And I, um, you know, I had that in the photo um, on Norway maple. Um, but if you remove a Norway maple leaf from its twig and um, just um, take notice of the, uh, the end of the petiole, the little stem that the leaf is attached to the twig by, um, the Norway maples will bleed a white milky sap or substance. That's sort of a um, way to tell Norway maple from the other maples. The other native maples don't leak a white milky sap. I don't know why, but that's one of the characteristics. But leaf shape is also a characteristic. And th the maples do all share the same um, um, branching habit where they're, they're opposite branch. So that's not gonna help you. But I, of I often find the, um, looking at the um, sap is helpful for folks. But if you look at maples a long time, like I have, you can develop a keen eye for the shape of the leaf as well. Big leaf, big, you know, broad leaf. That's why it creates, you know, it's devastating shade beneath it. And then uh, the other one was, uh, how do you control small ones? Well, um, they, uh, you know, prolifically seed themselves everywhere. And the small seedlings are very easy to pull out by hand, especially after a, uh, a rainy day when the ground is moist or after irrigating, or uh, if you're planning on going out and removing um, saplings, just to water the area well a few hours before and the saplings of not only maples, but everything will come out a lot easier. So, and that's, I see a question here, is crimson Norway maple considered invasive as well? Well, it, it doesn't seem to be, um, it, it's not as invasive or it doesn't really, I don't think it produces um, seedlings because it's probably sterile uh, because it's a, uh, it's a hybrid. Um, but the theory is, is that because it does produce flowers and pollen, it may be helping other Norway maples um, produce seed, so. Um, I would say it's, and again, because it's, um, it's not really um, a tree that you may want because of the dense shade that it provides, but I, it, because it doesn't really prolifically seed itself, I would, I would say that it's okay to leave it alone. <laughs> One more question, is spotted lanternfly a true fly or is it a beetle? So it's a, uh, it's a leaf hopper. It's actually a, um, it, it's in the same um, insect um, genus as um, aphids and other, and leaf, um, it's a plant hopper. So it's, it's closely related to leaf hoppers, which are much smaller, but it's like a, a giant um, leaf hopper. So it's a sap sucking insect, just like aphids. Aphids are pretty common on a lot of our urban trees. They're the, they're the little tiny insects. They come in green or, or red or any number of other colors that, and they produce the same kind of sticky substance, um, honeydew, um, because they f their feeding habit is the same as the um, spotted lanternfly. The thing with the spotted lanternfly is they're, you know, they're large, um, you know, they're about an inch long and they suck out of the tree a large quantity of sap. And because spotted lanternflies typically appear in groups of like hundreds and thousands, there's a lot of this sap that um, this uh, honeydew material, which is the excrement from the insect, um, 
these insects have very primitive digestive systems, so they don't process the sugars. Most of the sugar passes through their body and is um, excreted out. Actually, during prime feeding season in the summer, it's actually pumped out. You can see it shooting out of their posterior end um, in large quantities. So it becomes a um, real mess below the tree in a very short period of time. Um, if you wanna see some videos, go online, visit the uh, um, website that I uh, suggested and also uh, Penn State has a lot of um, information and videos on their website as well about spotted lanternfly. And you'll come across um, videos of uh, this um, shooting, this excrement being shot out of these uh, insects. So pretty disgusting. Excellent, and one last question we have. Do you have a reference for how to remove each of the invasives you covered and beyond? Um, I would, you know, I would suggest uh, visiting the um, websites. The DEC has all of the invasives and the recommendations for them on their website. So if you just um, do a search, um, New York State or NYSDEC and put the name of the invasive, um, there'll be a fact sheet with all the detailed information on there. We could probably spend an hour for each of the invasives that are out there. And I only covered eight out of, you know, maybe, um, you know, 60 to 80 invasives that are common in our area. So it's all, it's all on the, um, you know, you'll find a lot of information on the DEC's websites, as well as the Long Island um, Invasive Species Management Area website, the LISMA website. That's a, the best place to start because that'll lead you and link you to all the information you need. Thank you, Vinny. That seems to be all the questions we have tonight. If Great. anyone has any additional questions, you can contact us at Nassau at cornell.edu, and we'll get back to you on your question. Thank you all for coming out tonight. I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. I uh, put my um, information up on the screen, and the um, you can email me directly, or you can send an email to the Nassau at cornell.edu, and they will get it to me really quick. <laughs>